you to today's guest. I'm really thrilled that I can finally introduce him after many, many months of saying we're going to introduce him. He's here today. Our guest for today is Dr. Hakeem <laughs> Hadela. He is director of the program on medicine and religion here at the university. He's an associate professor of medicine in the sections of emergency medicine and general internal medicine, and he's also a faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Uh, as I said, he's an emergency medical physician, a health services researcher, and he's a bioethicist whose scholarship focuses on the intersection of community health, religious tradition, and bioethics. His empirical research assesses how religion-related factors impact health, behaviors, and outcomes among Muslim, um, uh, sorry, American Muslims and influences the practice of American Muslim physicians. His bioethics scholarship explores the ways in which the Islamic tradition and its authorities assess modern biomedicine and biotechnology. And a key focus of this research involves exploring how scientific data and ways of knowing can work in concert with traditional Islamic moral reasoning and theology to develop a comprehensive, holistic, and theologically rooted Islamic bioethics. So his topic here today is constructing the field of bioethics, why Islamic bioethics should matter to Islamic studies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fidel. Thank you, Chairman and Sarah, for uh, inviting me to participate, and thank you all for coming. I hope today we'll have an interesting conversation uh, about this topic. Um, so you might have heard that I come from across the street, right, from medical school. I'm um, here in a divinity school, and I lead this uh, sort of with John Yoon, this program of medicine and religion. And sometimes we think that these two worlds are very disparate. But if you just pause for a moment and think, you know, they are actually very connected. I'll share with you that in my talk, but also let me give you some ideas of how they might be connected. But both medicine and religion speak to ontology. They help us think about who we are and what our ends might be. Both medicine and religion speak to the idea of embodiment, right, and meaning making. What does it mean to be ill? As the literature that you have to actually give us a talk on uh, a few years ago, right? What does the literature talk about? What does it mean to be ill? What does it mean to be healthy? Then also, what does it mean to be a religious person in that state? And in both medicine and religion, at least according to Bullschweiger, contribute to the enhancing of life. Right? So, so I might not exactly believe that, but at least Bill Schweiker does, so I'm glad that I'm here. And that will start my talk about why Islamic biology should manage Islamic studies. <clears throat> if I can move the slides. Hold on. Oh, sorry. So within uh, the larger scope of the program of medicine religion, I particularly look at Islam and how Islam influences and informs medicine. And what I do sort of is look at three different domains as you heard uh, in the introduction. I look at how Islam influences the behaviors of Muslim patients. I look at how Muslim physicians think about Islam in their daily practice, how it informs the bioethical decision making that they proceed in. And also how scholars look at the entire field of biomedicine, right? So we, we are at this intersection between the Islamic tradition, Muslim practices, and biomedicine. And I use all of these sorts of different methods, empirical, textual, and also theological methods to understand this interconnection. Today, we're going to talk about the Islamic bioethics portion. So I'm going to talk about introducing this literature, which is very varied and has a lot of people talking within it. I'm going to talk about consumers and the producers of this literature, and then talk a little bit about the conceptual gaps in the field, as I see them, from someone who actually has a little bit of Islamic training, is a practicing physician, and then does bioethics work. I actually serve on the committee across the street. Then today, for our discussion, after my talk, we're going to sort of pose some questions around what does it mean to be Islamic, right? And what does Islamic and Islamic bias mean? So what does that mean for the source material and the methods of study in this field? What does it mean for embodiment and identity formation for those who practice medicine with an Islamic bioethics mode or within Islamic bioethics mode? And then what does it mean for the field in general in terms of epistemology and in terms of disciplinary boundaries? Where does Islamic bioethics actually reside within the spectrum between medicine and religion? So to begin with, I'm going to pose a question to all of you, and here's the question. Who needs or who searches for Islamic biophilic guidance? So if you have some thoughts, please share them with us. Chaplains. Chaplains. And why, in what ways? If they're helping a patient in the end of life decision, um, we want to consider the religious perspective and perhaps you know, that 
called ethics. So they want to understand the ethical sort of assessment around this. Okay, good. Other individuals or disciplines? Go ahead. Patients and parents of patients who are maybe transplant patients or something like that. Uh, and what, what are they searching for? Well, I mean, I would just guess they are searching for guidance and such and such. Permissible under our religion. Mm -hmm. Is it a good idea? Okay. Should I proceed? Okay. So again, ethical guidance in, in the context of what does the tradition say about this? Other thoughts? Please. Uh, researchers, mm -hmm. medical and biological researchers, would want to know if their methods are in conflict with certain practices or beliefs and if that's going to affect the efficacy of what they're discovering. Mm. Can you, can you expand on that for a second? What do you mean by the methods? I am not a <laughs> professional <laughs> scientist, and so I am just kind of imagining a scenario in which animal testing mm, is problematic, okay. or Very good. stem cell testing is problematic. Very good. It's certainly in conflict with other ways. <coughs> right, so you guys exactly, that's exactly an area where Islamic Bible guidance might be sought by researchers who are trying to understand or proceed in generalizing knowledge, but the entire modality of what they're doing might be conflicting with Islamic values. Good. Any other thoughts? So I'll share with you what usually when I ask this question in the medical audience, what they sort of said. So they talk about Muslim patients, as we heard here, right? And what concordance between the treatment modalities and Islamic conjunctions. They talk about physicians or healthcare providers who desire not just the ethics piece, but also philosophy. Right? For their practice, what does Islam have to say about medicine, healing? What does that mean? How do I embody that in my daily practice? Religious leaders, chaplains, or those individuals like that, or imams in the local mosque, right, will seek religiously and medically grounded resources for counseling the people who come to them, whether it be chaplains or patients or physicians. And then the larger body of healthcare institutions, right? So we serve here for Muslim patients, and people might, and other institutions that serve Muslim patients might want resources to provide culturally competent, high quality healthcare, right? How do Muslims think about certain things? How do you have to structure the healthcare system in a certain way to accommodate this patient population? But it leads to disparities in care if we don't do certain things. Right? So they are also, also seeking guidance from the Islamic bioethics. Now, <clears throat> everybody wants Islamic bioethics, but the question is, what do you find when you look at the literature? So uh, this is a little slow when I did it. But in any case, traditionally people think, okay, Islamic bioethics resides at this intersection, right? These two individuals are involved. So you have a physician, often, not a patient, but a physician, who then goes and talks to a scholar about the permissibility of organ transplantation or stem cell research. That scholar then thinks about you know, the sources of Islam, right, the moral sources of Islam, the Quran, the Sunnah, the objective of the law, ethical legal maxims, and then produces a fatwa, right? And he grades that act or that practice or that technology along the spectrum from permissible to forbidden. He gives it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And that's what people think, this is where Islamic practice resides. This is the source material for Islamic practice studies. This is it. These are fatawa. Yet, when you think about it, right, you can have many different scholars coming together, right? You can have many different positions coming together. And if all you're looking at is opinions of individuals, all you're looking at are opinions of individuals. That, that is what you're doing. You're not looking at any sort of you know, holistic body of literature. You're just looking at what one person says and what another person says. And I'll argue that's not a sign of violence. I mean, this is part of it, but is that is not all of what Islamic Bibles is, nor is that the only source material for Islamic Bibles research. So what do I mean? Let's think about what, who writes about Islamic Bibles. The computer keeps up with my cadence. Yes. So, you know, if you look as a physician, one of the things when I was in medical school, I was often asked, because I was one of the few Muslim students, right, what does Islam have to say, to say about so and so? What does Islam have to say about so and so? And when you're studying medicine, you realize that the only thing that you need to worry about, or the only source of knowledge for you, is medline. Right? Yeah, that is it, right? Because we don't have time to read books, and if you don't like to read books, you don't have time to read books, right? So, so you either go to up to date or you go to some research article in the New Journal of Medicine, and you say, this is what arthritis is, right? So we look to medline, and this is some these are some uh, sort of headers, let's say, to medline, where physicians predominantly are writing, or healthcare providers are writing about Islamic bioethics. So that's one genre, one scope of the field. And then you have books, right? You might go to Amazon or you might go to Google and say, okay, Islamic biopics, what comes up? 
And here you have a lot of different scholars talking, talking about slime patterns. Right? You might have slime studies individuals talking about slime patterns, you might have historians. So for example, right, you have an international law scholar, Dariosh, who puts this book together talking about this and problems and perspectives. You have a historian, right, who is John Brockup in the back, Muslim Medical Ethics. He had a conference, which I was at, talking about Islamic bioethics. And you might have other individuals contributing to this body of knowledge. Then you might look to actually organizations, predominantly healthcare organizations, or organizations that represent physicians or other professionals within that, who speak to Islamic bioethics. So the first top one is the Islamic Medical Association of America. Their ethics committee puts out some guidance for individuals. The one below is the Islamic Organization of Medical Science in Kuwait, right? Who puts out some guidance on what is Islamic about X, Y, Z. Then actually, you can actually even do studies on announcements from governments that say they are informed by Islam. So this is in the Ministry of Health in Iran, right? The Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia, right? Even Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So when their health ministry writes about something, you assume, or one might assume, that they're writing from some sense of what Islam has to say about X, Y, Z policy. So there was a lot out there that has to do with Islamic quote-unquote bioethics. And the challenge is, right, what are they talking about? Really? So if you're a patient or a physician, you will say, okay, well, you know, someone says this, some scholar says that, this body of scholars says this, this physician group says that, so what actually is right and wrong? I have no idea. They use different concepts, they use different terms, they employ different methods to pronouncements about their pronouncements of Islamic bioethics. And oftentimes, as a physician, I'll tell you, I find patients just struggling and thinking, oh, what, what do I do? I have no idea. Right? And I'll tell you, that is the problem, where the literature misses the gap. What we have is all these individuals using the various different disciplinary methods to opine on something, but they're actually talking past each other. They're not actually even using the same terms. And they're not coming to any sort of sort of scholarly consensus or anything. So we're left in confusion, right? I might say Islamic bioethics, some might say Islamic medical ethics, other person might say Muslim medical ethics, and you saw that book title. Or what, are we talking the same thing or are we talking different things? So you're, we're all confused. So then what happens, right? So I'm going to show you what physicians produce. So I will say that each one of these stakeholders, each one of these producers, be they physicians or jurists or Islamic juridical councils, they all have some clear gaps. So let me demonstrate. I don't want to talk about anybody else's guild. This is my own guild. These are physicians. I'll show you what they're producing and what they are. So this is a study done by a colleague of mine, Hassan Shanamani. Uh, he and uh, Muhammad Hassan Khalid did a study on Medline. Again, this is where we all go as physicians. They reviewed papers about from 55 years of uh, that, that big database and just look at Islam, Muslim, and bioethics. Those are the search terms. They got 160, sorry, 46 papers. So about three per year. And you see 39 were from the Middle East, right? 29 from the United States. But this is for our for our purposes, this is the problem right down here. Only 11 mentioned anything more than a single universal Islamic position on any topic. And only five meant five mentioned any concept of sources of Islamic law. Right? So about 55 years of of writing, 150 papers, five talk about sources of Islamic law. Right? Only 11 talk about anything but one position on any issue. Now, since we know that people have a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things, this can't be the case of Islam. Right? So what does it lead for us researchers? Well, we know and recognize that in the writings, at least of this group, lack scholarly depth, and they present the Islamic ethical legal tradition as monolithic and simplistic. So as scholars and students, right, we might recognize this, but I'm not quite sure patients would recognize it. Or the ethics committee that's looking for some guidance on brain that we For them, the physicians who are writing are at the forefront of the field, they should know the best. So then I did a study just a couple years ago, uh, funded by the John Temple Foundation. We did a national survey of Muslim physicians in the United States. So we had, you know, this is the survey methods, a male questionnaire, three ways with incentives. And we randomly sampled about 750 physicians from the Islamic Medical Association of America. We chose the Islamic Medical Association because they say Islamic, right? It could have been the Pakistani Association, but we wanted to look at those who actually inform themselves with a Muslim identity. So here are some results. You know, the 85% report being somewhat or very familiar with Islamic bioethics. You know, the 60% report that Islamic bioethics somewhat or greatly influences their practice. So on the surface, this might look very good. But look at this.
Right. So, so, you know, a little more than half never really leave any of those books that I showed you. Uh, nearly two thirds never really talk to those jurists who produce these pronouncements. And almost 80% never look to these medical thick academies which bring together jurists, right, and physicians to apply on an issue. So they at least bring two disciplines together. So they don't know what they don't know. Right? They think they know in science bioethics, but really, at least from this sort of snapshot, they're not engaging with the body of literature that has something to do with Islamic violence. So as I said, I'll, I'll, I can kind of, you know, uh, throw shade on my own guilt, but I'll tell you, if you want to talk to me after this talk, that I can say the same thing about jurists, right? Particularly if you look at a lot of the juridical writings, they use these two concepts, right? Mastahat, the interest good, and lavura, right? So dire necessity, to apply to some bias question. I mean, if you just look at just juridical writings, you'll say that most of them use either one or the other to permit something, or medicine, right? So, can you use porcine valves? Is there's a muscle as a public need? Is necessity for life permitted? And if you think about what that means, right? Porcine valves, okay, fine. But medicine is beyond these sort of conceptions of everything is life saving or everything is going to die. Right? Most of medicine doesn't do with deal with life and death. It deals with chronic disease management. And if things like this sort of don't give us a sense of what medicine is about, right? if I have an organ transplant, I can tell you an organ, a kidney versus a heart versus an eye, right? What their longevity is based on the patient's sort of circumstances. They have 50% life expectancy in five years or 20%. That is not thought about in general literature at all, right? That medicine has its own sort of ways of thinking about their own practices, and they use methods to think about that. Everything's either life-saving, therefore it has to be done. So anyway, that's some sense of what happens, but the jurors also have some conceptual gaps when they look upon biomedicine. So here's the state of the field, right? There are many different uh, sort of producers with different discipline methods who come together with different goals and expertise, and there's a silent problem, there's a little crosstalk. In terms of what Islamic bioethics means and what is Islamic, I just showed you everybody has sort of their own view on Islamic might be, right? Jurists have a view, physicians have a view, bodies of uh, physicians, I'm sorry, governmental organizations have a view. So what actually is Islamic? And then we within bioethics have this issue of the scope of our own field, right? Is there public health ethics or is that under bioethics, right? Is clinical health ethics within the bioethics or is it separate from bioethics? So we have all these issues about the scope of our own field of bioethics that also come into play with this sort of growing field. The methodological issues, you know, what are the source materials for the field? And what a researcher who is doing their dissertation on the science bioethics look to the jurists writing, go to the physicians writing, they go to the methodological studies of what happens actually in a clinic in Iran. And what are the what are the ways that we understand what is Islamic bioethics? in terms of the source material for study. That's a challenge. Also, what are the methods to use to research and develop the field? So if I'm a jurist writing, what are my sources to move, or to think, or what are the sources I use to think about biomedicine? Right? Do I use a thought about medicine? Do I actually go read stuff that's having in general medicine? How do I think about that? How do I, how do I conceptualize the field? Right? So how come right? that you have to have a good conceptualization of the field before you yield or you know, judge about something. Do we have that conceptualization? Then there are practical issues, as I said, you know, for me, I'm a physician, I deal with patients, I'm worried about my own practice, I'm worried about what they ask me about a science expense, and this is not actually thought about much, right? That there are practical issues. If you look at pronouncements, they often cannot be applied in the field, right? So that, that is another problem. And there's a crisis of authority, lastly. And so when they call for a science bioethics, oftentimes I get these calls from various hospitals to help with some ethical issue, right? Am I the person she's seeking? Or is it the person, the imam at the local mosque, right? Who has some sense of responsibility to the person who's in your hospital? Is that the authority, right? Or is it some juridical council in Saudi Arabia that's applying this something? So we have a crisis of authority that plagues this field as well, as it does in many other areas of the world. So that's sort of the, the, the overlay of the field. And the next sort of set of slides is going to have you sort of engage with questions of the field that I'm struggling with. I think you all have a piece upon this, and I hope that we'll have a conversation about that. But I'm going to try to show you that Islamic bioethics is a site for all these contestations that occur in Islamic state itself. So why is it important? It's because this is the site, right? So let me give you an example. You might have recently, I don't know if you know this, this book right now, Shahad Ahmed was actually a teacher of mine. I took a class with him uh, back in AUC. His amazing book that came out recently, What is Islam, right? And the importance of being Islamic. If you think about this field, I think all these questions that he asks, right, and sometimes has interesting ways of answering, are present in the field. When we think about Islamic bioethics, it's concerned with the normative. Right? What is Islam? 
some might take Islam to science perspective and say, well, Islam, in my sort of field, is a tradition of practices observed by a community. Right? It's a meaning-making system that's adopted by individuals that represents Islam. That's a picture of Islam. Others who are maybe in Islamic law might say, well, look, Islam has to do with you know, our, 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 our sort of texts, right? And the way that we use our texts to approach ethical issues, so it has to do with legal uh, issues of lit, it has to do with adab or virtue, how we develop virtue, right? Or some might say, well, it has to do with sort of ontology and metaphysics and kalam, how does it intersect? Or Sufi practices, how we think about incorporating an ideal and a view that God is in front of us, how does that mean? What does that mean for being a physician, right? So we have these challenges in Islam. What is normative? How do we think about the normative? How do we get an entire conceptualization of the normative? Then, once we understand that, or have a pretty good view on that, then we say, we start labeling things as Islamic or not Islamic, right? So is it a source foundedness? If someone in a, in a writing, right, in a position in writing a medline, sort of quotes a verse of the Quran, does that make what he's saying Islamic, right? Or he says there's a tradition of a prophet. That makes it Islamic, is it source founded? Or if someone says, well, I'm going to quote this Ayatollah, right? Some scholarly class that is transmitting Islamic, or they're creating Islamic, does that give the authority? Right? This happens in our field, this is, and this happens in Islam in general. The other issue that has to do with Islamic State is law and ethics, right? So you talk about what can I do, what should I do, how do I move from producing good, right, to being good? And this is a, the question whether this is the boundedness of Islamic law and ethics, the scope of ethics in our tradition. Does ethics actually even reside within a particular discipline within the Islamic tradition? These are questions that come to fore within the Islamic dialect. Then in terms of moving from sort of normative, we think about Islamic thought and study in general, right? These sorts of notions of what is Islam and what is Islamic informs how you're going to study the field. So if I think Islam means certain things, I'm going to look for those certain things within the pronouncements and the writing. If I think Islamic means something, then we have projects, like there's a project in the that I'm involved with, thinking about how we create a genomics, um, genomics research institute based on Islamic sort of values. That renewal revival project has to do with Islamic. You have to have, understand what Islam means to then say, I will make this Islamic, right? So this, this occurs within the field. And obviously, you know very well that who is an expert, what is their expertise, and who's an authority, and who's not an authority, that informs the production of a tradition or a body of literature. And that pervades all the Islamic in general. So as I said, I think the nascent field of side practice is a modern side, right? Not a historical side, to work out questions about tradition and modernity. Sorry, I'm going to it. Then and moving on, I think you know, we think about this other notion of embodiment. Right? So to so this flyer, just so you know, uh, was a recruitment tool in a hospital around Toronto where there was a bed in an adjacent hospital of women in the OR wearing the head scarf. Right, so a lot of nurses left. They said, well, we don't care what's on your head. You know, we care what's in it, so come here and work. So you use this notion of, of an identity formation of what it means to be Muslim to that individual as a recruitment tool for a healthcare system. So, so Islamic values has to do with identity formation and identity politics. Right? What is an Islamic physician or a Muslim physician? Is it one who practices Islamic medicine? Several years ago, I was in this, in this exact uh, hall, and we had an individual, an alum, I think, presenting a book that he wrote about sort of, you know, medicine through the Islamic tradition, or some notion of medicine through the Islamic tradition, or philosophy of medicine. Right? Is that what what Islamic physician would be, or Muslim physician would be? One who practices some notion of Islamic medicine, or is it one who follows the dictates of the law? Right? So someone just following, well, look, poor sign, X, Y, Z is prohibited. That makes me a Islamic physician because that's what I'm going to do. So when I write a prescription, I say, you know. Don't use gel caps, but tablets, right? Uh, sorry, tablets, right? No gel caps, but tablets for this medicine because that's, of course, I'm dealt with it. That makes me a Um Or is it someone who internally says, you know, I went into medicine because I was called by God to do medicine. We have people like that as well. So does that make them Islamic? Just that notion of an internal identity? Then what does it mean in terms of being Muslim in our context, right? in our total context? Right? So we have these notions of conscious clauses or conformity. So uh, just a clear example would be across the street, you know, we have this debate around vaccinations to healthcare workers. <coughs> are they mandatory or are they not? Can you have an exemption? Can you claim conscience? Whether it be religious basis or some other basis. And that debate has to do with how you think about being a Muslim in a total context. Right? Maybe there are two physicians in our hospital Muslim. Are they going to be conscious? What are they going to do? Are they going to be taken out of place? 
So this, this politics of identity also comes into play in this field. And then one, this question here actually was, is, is a large question for not just identity politics, but how we think of ourselves as Muslims. But is whatever notion of Islamic ethics, whatever notion you have, is Islamic ethics for Muslims? Or is it for all? Right? Is this something that is a, 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 a parochial sort of idea of, well, we're in a Muslim country, we're going to operate in Islamic bioethics. But here in the United States, as a pro society, there is no such thing as Islamic bioethics. What are we talking about? And what is the goal and aim of that fear? So these questions are, 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 rel are relevant to Islamic thought and Islamic studies, or Muslim studies, or whatever you want to talk about, right? So the notion of Islamic or Muslim position, this notion of self identification with faith informs description and cultural studies of that tradition, of that faith. And the notion of identity formation and politics within a pro context, right, engages notions of what we think of citizenship, right, of secularism, what the bounds of that are, and modernity, what the modern nation state is, and what it requires as citizens. These are all coming into play within this field of Islamic bioethics. So I would say that Islamic bioethics, right, quote unquote, requires understanding how the ethical becomes lived. You connect Islamic right, with Muslim studies in a modern context. This field also operationalizes these sorts of constructs and these sorts of questions and these contestations. So I think it's a very ripe area of study. So now just I want to end shortly. Um, thinking about, uh, you, you know, gazing upon modernity. So this is a picture from the uh, Museum of Islamic Art in, uh, in Doha, right? And it's, it's really interesting because you can actually gaze upon all modernity. Right? And the last, I was there in 2005 uh, when I was still in medical school. And then if you go any year after, you'll see that they built five new buildings. Right? So I've been back as recently as last year. They just are building and building and building. And you're thinking about, well, how do you, how do you think about a tradition? in modern growth, right? So that has to do with some notions of science and epistemology. So let me give you two examples that how Islamic values deals with the science and Islam dialectic. So a question for us, for example, might be, right, are ethical, legal, technical concepts and imaginary stated, right? This historicity argument versus essential conception argument, right? So an example might be this notion of istihada, which is, again, I'm using this course on uh, example a lot. So istihada has to do with the notion of something that is formally uh, prohibited to becoming permissible. It's undergoing some sort of transmutation, some sort of process of change. The classic example was, you know, that wine is impermissible, but vinegar is permissible for the pot, right? What is occurring to make that permissible? Or the skin uh, can hide is permissible, but eating a pig is not. So what is happening? And the term that was used by scholars is of this construct, of this idea, is this the halal, and they use this in Islamic law. Something becomes halal, it becomes permissible. Now is that a, 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 a sort of a, a imagination of that construct is one that's dependent upon the imagination of that time, right? So what they thought is actually, or we have to figure out what that global process was to apply. So today in Malaysia, for example, we have an entire industry that does DNA marker testing, testing for porcine within their medical sort of instrumentation and therapeutic sort of, uh, therapeutic modalities, literally. They're looking for genetic markers and traces of porcine DNA within whatever medicine you've made. Because they want to be sure that it doesn't have to do with using an impermissible substance in medicine. Other scholars in Saudi Arabia say it's transmuted. When it undergoes pharmaceutical processes, this is transmuted. It's the how that applies. So this conceptualization of how you incorporate and engage with historical constructs in a modern context has to do with the science about this as well. Lastly, let's think about for a moment how we integrate scientific knowledge and data into moral law. So the shared view this notion of this maslaha, right, public interest, public benefit, and the law our necessity. But one might say that there might, you know, there might be an ability to think about scientific knowledge in general, right? Is medicine a certain knowledge or is it probabilistic? If you look at medieval texts, and when, physician, uh, when jurists talked about the moral status of medicine, they were engaging with this notion of certainty of medicine. They use examples, well, a doctor said something, it didn't happen, so we can't trust medicine. Therefore, we cannot make medicine an obligation to see. Right? This notion of certainty of science. Today, when you know, John and I do our studies and empirical studies, we talk about you know, probabilities. We assess, well, is this finding, this association you know, statistically valid because it couldn't happen by random chance, or could it have happened by random chance? So we engage in the same notion in medicine, and those two ideas come together in forming more law. How we think about science, how we think about medicine, how we think about the weight of science and medicine and evidence, and that inform the way that we use theoretical concepts to opine about medicine. 
this is another area of integrated uh, science and medicine. So in the end, here's this last, this is my last slide. Right? So when I think about this field, you know, I write about this field, I think about one that also engages with, with multi inter transdisciplinarity. So on one hand, I would say that I think that for a notion of Islamic bioethics, the Islamic quotient comes from these sort of shaded areas, right? The inputs, this is, this is the moral machinery of Islamists coming together to offer an ethical legal assessment. Islamic law, theology, moral theology, sort of the, um, you know, ethics, nada, right, or virtue. That these are the moral inputs from the Islamic tradition that then have to interact with all these other domains of knowledge. Right? Clinical practice, social science, medical sciences, philosophy, bioethics, and policy. To produce something that has a notion of Islamic bioethics. But if you're just working in one area, then you're just working in one area. And you're not engaging with the field. You're not engaging with the questions of the field. So I'm going to leave you with that so that we have some conversation. I want to present it. Thank you. Question. I might get some water before I do that. <laughs> through a story of when you were struggling or challenged by a particular patient who had a biomedical question about what processes you went through to help that person? Okay, uh, I have many, but, but I'll, I'll point you towards this. So today I don't, vaccines are on my mind, so, so I'll share with you. So here I wrote about a personal answer story about vaccines in H1N1, this was many years ago. And so um, in Michigan, uh, you know, I was at a hospital in Michigan, the H1N1 scare at that time, people talking about pandemic, right? And uh, the way that vaccine procurement works by state is that states are allowed to choose what formulations they can bring in. Okay. So the FDA had, had allowed seven different formulations of this vaccine in the United States. And Michigan, which has interesting about 350,000 Muslims, right, procured three brands that all had porcine gels in them. Okay. So, so at my hospital, because of the pandemic scare, they had actually mandated that, that physicians on the front lines get vaccination. So, so, so there was a quandary. Well, I knew that this vaccine had porcine gelatin. Now, there are many different views within Islamic law about that. At the same time, my wife was pregnant with our second child. Okay. So, so the question became, do I take this for someone else's benefit? Okay. Do I go outside of my own, so I follow Hanafi law, right, first and first of worship stuff. So do I go and use a different opinion from a different school of law, right? Um, or do I actually try to go to an indigenous state and procure, to procure a vaccine that is permissible? Right? And my wife asked me, what should I do? Now, she, I, and I wrote this sort of uh, narrative by this piece about, well, is she asking me as a physician? Is she asking me as um, uh, her husband? Is she asking me as someone who knows something about a sign? What is she asking me? And my, often my response to her is, is one that she doesn't like. Meaning I say, well, what do you think you should do? <laughs> what do you want to know? Right? And, and, and it leads to these sorts of cycles where she just gets upset with me and I'm sleeping on the couch. But in any case, um, so I wrote that whole story up because because uh, the question was, well, you should ask her the scholars what in the end. So she asked her the scholar who gave some interesting opinion, which I felt was misguided, and she asked, asked someone else. She asked someone else, and I was like, well, they don't understand what vaccines are. The vaccines aren't pure. Or they're so, so it became this entire quandary of how you deal with this issue. So I'll, I'll give you that reference to the email. I'll give you that reference. But I go through how what ended up happening was that um, I actually didn't date anyone. She did, but she didn't ask the secondary question. Meaning, she, someone said it's permissible, and she said that is sufficient for me. Right? I'm not going to understand his reasoning. I'm not going to ask, and you have no ability to say anything about his reasoning. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to talk about. Please, yes. Okay. Um, so my question is, there is, of course, sometimes this um, uh, annoyance with uh, jurists if they just say, oh yeah, well, if it's necessary, just do it. Uh, but I mean, to what extent is it also um, uh, a kind of a crutch of a, of a minority to lean on jurists and say, well, you tell us what to do, and they just say, well, that's not, you know, that's not, you know, we have, you know, 
we should be happy and just say, yeah, if it's necessary, do it with it. The rest, you somehow figure it out. Yeah. You somehow develop something where you can figure it out. So if right. there is no, you know, if there is no proper, <clears throat> you know, ethical discussion, if, if there is so little uh, uh, publication on this uh, that there is no standing ethical discourse, and people just, whenever they're in a, they have a question, they just walk, they, they just go over to a jurist. You know, isn't that rather the, the fault of? the community than an issue with, with jurists? Yeah, so I think this is a very, very important question. I think there's, there's several ways I'll, I'll sort of I'll circle this question. One, I think that, that, that there is a sense of, of jurists or, or, or values. They want to be relevant to society, right? And one of the ways, and, you, and I don't know how you might do the study, is that you know when you think about, you know, when, you, when you do the study of sort of orations, right? And you notice that jurists and, and sermonizers often use medical sort of terminology, talking about when you have a medical problem, you go to a doctor, right? When you have a religious problem, you go to a religious scholar. So they adopt the notion of authority, sometimes even using the medical example, because they want to be relevant to society, all right? So, so um, I think that in, when they want, so I'm not saying this is as a class issue, but then they engage with scientific knowledge of that community, right? Whether it be politics or it be economics or it be medicine. The question then becomes, how do they understand that knowledge body, right? When they're kind of, are they saying they're experts or are they substituted? Yeah, so they're, they're, their knowledge is substituted to someone else. They're, they're just taking knowledge from someone else and then they're kind of. So I think this notion of, of what their boundedness is and what their disciplinary boundaries, uh, sorry, the disciplinary boundaries are, comes into this field. I would say that the people who, um, I'm dealing with the nuances of today. Have to have the requisite knowledge to deal with nuances of today, and it's not because they are the ones who are in that role. So the Islamic Fiqh Academy of OIC, they set themselves up as a body who will then pronounce opinions on some area, right? The community might advise them, but they have done this authority structure. Then it's their due diligence in that field to know that field. So that's one way. Right, so I think it's not just a community problem, it's a problem of their own selves, because they want to be relevant and they should feel that they can offer guidance to you know, the policy of them. Another, another way I'll answer that question would be, okay, well then, you know, what uh, the notion of there isn't a standard convention to the field, so they shouldn't be faulted, right? But actually there is. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about, there is, I just show you this, different streams of knowledge, right? There's different writers writing in this area. And, and, and when you're thinking about a question at the bedside, you're thinking about, well, this is a question that is relevant for the patient, for the provider, for the healthcare system. And there are actually ways in which other moral communities have addressed these questions. So if I don't have one from my field, I can look right from my particular religious tradition, I can look to other moral communities. Or I can invite those individuals who are involved in the decision, physicians, patients, and others, to come together. And we will then issue something that has perspectives that are drawn from all these individual these disciplines or these individuals. So I think another way, it's not just that that issue might be, well, the community has created for us for that to happen, right? Then the community is liable. So if you're only asking one person, you're not sort of engaging all the different individuals and different moral agents in that same scenario, bringing that involves physician, patient, family, and you're not bringing the patient, I mean, the physician or the patient together, then th there's a problem. The last thing I'll sort of say is that I think that as 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 a as in any field, right, uh, modernity has challenged us to think about our structures of knowledge, right, uh, our sort of different uh, epistemologies of thinking about things. And I think that this in this area, jurists themselves, right, have to think about whether they are jurists, right, uh, or are they? I don't, I'm, let me take a step back. Are they in the classical system? Are they bodies, right? Are they muftis, is what I'm trying to say, right? Or are they sort of, you know, musallas or musannas, right? What is their particular role? And are they using a classical system of knowledge bases and gradations within Islamic legal jurisprudence, uh, legal scholarship, and bringing that today? Or are they all one size comes a fits all? And sometimes I think that's actually a problem I think the jurists themselves, right? Where where they have to understand they have some knowledge bases and gradations within that, and how are they applying within this area on the basis of that structure? Um, well, thanks for coming. And uh, as someone who's uh, probably very uninformed about bioethics, I find myself uh, sitting there and wondering if the uh, situation with Christian bioethics would be uh, any different 
than what you described with Islamic bioethics, both in, in general and also around the particulars of the uh, of the survey you did that seem to indicate that uh, physicians uh, seem to think they're knowledgeable about it, but maybe they're not as knowledgeable as they, as they think. Yeah. Any comments on that or? So, so I, you know, I haven't done detailed studies of Christians. I think John might, you might know something about that from from Farm's work about what how uh, uh, the national surveys of physicians how Christians think about their social knowledge. I do agree with you. That's why we're saying that there's analogous, right? This notion of religious communities, moral communities, and how they engage with a scientific area, quote unquote, right? Actually, are resonating across sort of you know, Hindu, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, whatever it might be. So I think these are not particular to Islam. I'm just saying that this is a site where we know these contestations play out in the Islamic Studies Academy. I'm just sort of showing a well, look on that side of the campus. These contestations are at the bedside. And we have to think about that, engage across disciplines to, to inform ourselves about what to do. So I think they're, they, they're analogous in Christian bioethics. And I know a little bit from these conferences I've been at uh, with, with, with some of the interesting sort of dialogue that happens within communities and across communities, but I'll leave it to experts to play with that. The numbers are the same. Yes? Uh, let me get her. No, sorry. Please go ahead. Um, so, when you look at Islamic uh, bioethics and Islamic bioethics, you can literature. And basically, the entire academic world of where Islamic bioethics are going. How do you translate that to a population who doesn't necessarily have the academic background to go through this literature and this work to hopefully like increase community health outcomes for American Muslims and Muslims and increase trust in the healthcare system? Yeah, I think I think that gets a little bit to Professor Shamsi's sort of question, right? So 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 how does it at the ground level how do we deal with this, right? Do we expect everybody to become expert in everything, right? So and this is where the analogy I already used, right? When you have to make a, a will, you go to the lawyer, right? And you have to ask them this question, you ask a religious person, you have to medical, you know, right? That breaks down very quickly, right? And living as a normal human being in the day, it just breaks down very quickly. So, so I, 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 my answer to you is I think that this, as this field grows, and, and some of the work that I do, we actually try, I try to use the medical ideas. Okay, well, here is levels of evidence for science and ethics, right? So if you want to get the highest level of evidence that brings two knowledges or three knowledges together, you go to general academies, right? If you want to make a personal decision, right, about something specific, it's not a restricted exercise, and go to a trusted scholar who you believe can understand the issues, right? So we have these, so when I am in different spaces, we talk about seeking levels of evidence, and for those who are researchers, we go through the different methodologies, right? What is the limits of fatwa review, right? Fatwa are contingent, right? They they give contingent answers, so if you don't understand the contingencies, then you're not gonna be able to do a, a sort of holistic theorization from them. So we talk about that, but I think it's just the beginning, and we need more individuals to get involved so that we can then grow this field and get both manuals for patients and physicians, but also manuals for researchers and scholars. Yes? So you you brought up the, the pork fat CD and pork valve several times, and I'm just wondering, do you, maybe you know, or does the literature tell you, what are what are the actual hot button issues, maybe other yeah. than pork so, so, you know, um, so there, I'm reminded by your question about a study that was done of, of, of Physician, I'm uh, sorry, bioethics communities in Muslim countries. And you know, I think it's interesting, and, and, and I, as of why I use the questions, because everything that's exotic becomes a hot topic, right? Stem cell, right? Maybe organ transplantation, but you know, we have we have hot, these exotic topics that are the ones people say we should talk about. But the core issues that physician faces, right? What is my relationship to a patient? Is it fiduciary or is it not? Through an Islamic lens, people don't think about it. Right? But that has to do with every encounter I have with a patient. Yeah. Right? Whether I should give gel caps or tablets. I mean, all the time we prescribe medicines, right? So what is my responsibility to do that or not do that? Am I sitting if I'm giving gel caps? Right? It's not a hot, sexy topic, but it's one that's germane to the field. And you won't find any to tell on that. Right? Because that's not why you can get these high calibers to come together to talk about it. That is just, right? You can invite them and say, why do you want to talk about gel caps? I want to engage with something and more substantive, but these are the substantive issues of the country. <coughs> so, so, so my response then, end of life, right? We spend so much money end of life care, right? Brain death is a nice entry point into that, but how do you think about, you know, making decisions at the end of life? How, what decision aids we give patients and families? Who's the decision maker, the moral agent, right? Who's, who's more responsible, who's, who's the wali in some sense? These questions are not 
so present in those books and those sort of But I think are the ones that are most consequential to patients and physicians at the best side. Please. Could, could I ask you to go one slide back? Sure. Um, my question is about this. Um, I guess I'm wondering what you understand the relationship to be between the disciplinary partners and the inputs. And the way I would put the question is this, if I'm following you correctly, the disciplinary partners are axiomatically part of the process of giving medical care. The inputs are voluntary. That's to say they may have import, they may not. They're minimally, they're voluntary to the degree that whether the patient or the practitioner mm -hmm. is of a particular religious tradition or not, they come into play or they don't. So I guess what I want to know is, how should that, in your mind, inflict the phrase Islamic bioethics? In other words, I, and I don't know the answer, but, but just to put the case a particular way to, to provoke you a bit, aren't we really talking about bioethics per se, in the sense that all doctors have ethical standards, and it's probably good that they do, um, but then there are, in fact, moments or, or, play, or points in the appropriate care when religion should play a role. And if that's right, then should we be talking about bioethics from an Islamic perspective rather than Islamic bioethics? Very good. So, excellent. So I'm going to respond by, in two ways. So I just did a, a, a narrative, uh, a systematic literature review of the last five years of writings of the top 10 bioethics journals on uh, genomics and genetic therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think we had 1,400 some ridiculous amount of papers. Okay. Within them, three presented any religious views. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. The one on Islam was some interviews of some yeah. sort of people in religion. Yeah. Okay. That was it. Yeah. I often write in bioethics journals, right? Yeah. And so the question becomes, am I a bioethicist or am I someone who thinks about Islam? Right. right, and it's not part of the modern discourse. So that's okay. one way. So that gives you a sense of what I'm okay. thinking about this. Okay. Right. So I would fully agree with you. I'm doing bioethics, but the field has its own conventions of what enters okay. and what doesn't enter. Mm -hmm. And at times we have to adopt those conventions to have a space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, and then the second way I also would say is that that in terms of uh, the, the, the 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 notion of these are I, mean, I want to talk about uh, I think that the the scope of bioethics, right? So as you said, that everybody's informed by some notion of what is ethical, what is good, and it's voluntary whether that, or it's sort of, uh, at least comes into play, not only voluntary whether religious, but what ex to what extent a religious, you know, uh, uh, sort of framework actually applies to you, I think is also important. So when we think about, uh, not only important, but it actually answers your question, because I think that as a Muslim bioethicist, using what terms, and as a bioethics, a bioethicist, my roles are a bit different. What do I mean by that? So as a Muslim bioethicist, I'm not necessarily dealing with the normative, meaning I'm giving you, as a person who's in a council or a committee, views on what people are sort of saying. But when my wife asks me a question, she's not asking me what opinions are. She's asking me, as her husband, who has some idea of what the role of a husband should be for a wife in an Islamic family and context, to give her an Islamic opinion for her, so because I'm only responsible for her care to God. Right? And I don't bring that into my academic life, but I think that there's that, that notion of these inputs sometimes isn't voluntary because of who you are in other contexts, right? not as a bioethicist, but as an individual. So, the, so if I think of myself as that person in that context, then I might be having to call upon different expertise and domains and, and a non-voluntary factor to play out a role as a Islamic Muslim person for her family. I don't know if that is that, but I'm giving you a sense that there's this tension between what we think of as a field as a researcher, but also what happens in the daily living or being individuals in a certain context. Thank you. So now I have a question. Oh, all right. So as a bioethicist and being a physician, dealing with the public in general, wouldn't you say that if you have a responsibility to God, that that would play into whatever service that you're providing for the general public mm. versus just what you would do at home in general? 
So, so I, I, yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, I agree. But let me. I think this, these, these questions. Let me sort of rephrase what I'm saying. So, in the sense that I asked, the question is field is Islamic. Is Islamic whatever you think of Islamic in that physiology, bioethics for for Muslims or for all? Right. Does being an Islamic physician or a Muslim physician mean something different? Right. This is a question for the field. Meaning, if we're going to create a Islamic bioethics academy or we're going to write on Islamic bioethics, you have to have some conceptualization to address that. And when you study individuals in the hospital, you used to, if I'm being interviewed, right, then you have to understand what that particular individual's notion or relationship to their Islam and their Muslimness is or is not. So what I was sharing with you was in this notion, yes, so my notion of what is right and wrong, as someone would say that I am not just an informist in the, in the, in the medical relationship, I'm not just informing someone, right? But actually, I'm helping them to escape their values, making opinions, everything that we do has some moral sort of balance to it, right? That I'm drawing in not only their values, but also my own, when I'm making shared decision making. I fully agree, that's part of being a physician, right? Some might disagree, but there are many in the field who agree that that's you are moral agents together coming to some sort of shared procedure or some sort of shared value. So I'm not saying that they're divorced. What I'm trying to say is that there are different roles that we just play within the context of our lives. And for just this field, right, has to, when you're looking at this field, you have to think about that when you're studying who's writing what they're saying, right? You know, how they're writing, how they're thinking about it. Sometimes that's not actually explicit. So that's what I'm saying. Does that answer your question? So I mean, we're moral agents in a moral enterprise. So you can't divorce that, right? This is the whole point of medicine. You can't divorce that. But sometimes that is not the problem, right? Most of the cases that I deal with in the ethics committee, there's nothing really to do with Islam or religion, just information giving, you know, being transparent, right? Helping people come to decisions that they're struggling with. That's most of the work. It has nothing necessarily to do with religious conflict in the medical arena. We're really out of time. Uh -huh. So thank you so much, Dr. Phil. Thank you.